Well, good morning, good evening, everyone. Whatever it may be for you where you're watching this video. I was recently given a little request to um, speak of my time when I attended GIT back in 89 and 1990. Now, mind you, I didn't graduate uh, the school. Um, I lived in Glendale and the school was in Hollywood. And I used to drive my Camaro. It was a 77 Type LT, candy apple red. It was nice. Um, to uh, Hollywood from Glendale and about maybe three quarters of the way through the uh, my term there, my one year, uh, one year school, um, I cracked the engine block, uh, got it too hot. I didn't put oil in it. See, I was guitar player, uh, musician, uh, went to Hollywood from the Midwest, and um, I think the car was the least of my concerns, you know. It's more focused on my chops and my hair, right? <laughs> anyway, so how I started uh, basically to even entertain the idea of uh, going there when I was younger was uh, both of my teachers were um, MI grads. Um, this guy Larry, uh, I remember Larry, he was really cool. It's kind of hard to deal with his smell. He had kind of pretty bad body odor. Um, but that was my first guitar teacher and um, we just got, you know, kind of split up in time because Every time it rained, um, if I had a lesson, and it was a rainy day anyway, um, it, I didn't have a lesson because his uh, car didn't have windshield wipers. So, you know, he didn't really last that long because it was a rainy season uh, at one point in time. And I moved on to another teacher, and his name was Terry. So I have Larry, GIT grad, and Terry. And Terry was cool. Terry was like... You know, Terry was homosexual, which was kind of bizarre, um, but cool. I mean, you know, it's not a problem. It's just it was, you know, I was a kid and, you know, and I was like, I don't know, 14 and Terry was like 22 and, but he was the coolest guy in the world and, and, and he, he was never strange with me in any fashion. But anyway, I got Larry and Terry, and both of them were GIT grads, so they both tell me about Joe Pass, Joe DiOrio, um, and all these guys that I didn't care about, right? You know, uh, they're sitting in teaching me in my room, and I got, you know, poster or pictures of Warren Martini and George Lynch, and, and they're like, oh yeah, those guys are, yeah, those guys are good, you know? You know, they're just like, we want to, you know, show you show you the foundation where these guys are coming from don't just learn their stuff you know um, by ear even though I was already picking a lot of this stuff up just by kind of um, sheer determination you know I mean I don't know how many tape decks and um, cassette tapes I've worn out um, by you know recording off of the album onto cassette so I could fast forward rewind fast forward or whatever and move it around so after Larry and Terry then I was um, about 16 16 years old and um, I you know I had taken the college entrance tests and stuff like that you know to go to um, I got accepted at DePaul and it was a university in Chicago, I think, or Illinois. And I was going to, you know, go there to, to maybe study composition, theory, stuff like that. But I was, like, already studying that in high school, you know. And we were, you know, doing sonatas and whatever. You know, you had to understand what a sonata, a concerto, or all that stuff. And I was very much, again, still into, um, like, Dio, you know. I, I, I listened to Dio, like, religiously. Um, Vivian Campbell was just a huge influence on me back in the day. So, you you know, you have your, your George Lynch. I mean, forget about it. I, I learned tooth and nail, you know, like, I had to know every little riff and 
when he flatted the fifth, I couldn't figure it out. I used to just hit the bar chord and shake it. <laughs> I just hit the fifth and just yank on it, and I was, I could never figure out. I'm like, wow, this guy must have some kind of magical hand that he's hitting some note I can't play. And little did I know, it was in between the four and the five. So, you know, even with some kind of classical background, you know, uh, you know, you had to um, then figure out, well, there's the intervals, and this is this, and this is that. And anyway, so, so then I, I eventually went out there. Now, before I went out there, me and my friend, we had a pact, okay? He was a bass player. He was like a Billy Sheehan. He's like a wizard, you know, like a, I don't know, Tony Bremer, TJ Racer, Nitro, you know, one of these technical, flashy bass players. Unbelievable musician, too. He was very skilled. Um, and we had a pact. He said, it, we're going to be in this contest. It was a guitar contest. And um, he said, we're going to get it. We'll enter it. And if you win, you're going to take me to Nam because that was the prize, to go to Nam. And it was like awesome you know it was like a dream in chicago right and we were in cedar rapids iowa at that point so i was living in iowa so lo and behold we enter the contest i think uh, he won and i don't even think I, I i think i got third place or something i don't even think i got second because there's you know it's just you never know who's going to show up you know some you know m wizard um from nowhere i mean we were pretty pretty much hot shots, you know, we, we thought, you know, we, we were kind of doing like Racer X tunes and stuff together, and we kind of thought, we even did Devil Went Down to Georgia at the, um, his high school talent show, and Devil Went Down to Georgia was kind of a bear to learn, I had to do that by ear, and I'm, I'm not sure if I got all the chromaticism or anything, I was more playing it within the scale, but we did our own version of it anyway, and it was pretty cool, we did Ice Cream Man and, and that one, by Charlie Daniels. So anyway, lo and behold, so he wins, and he's a bass player. He wins the guitar contest. So I'm stoked. I'm going to Nam either way. I didn't even care, you know. And the guy that beat me was also that second place guy was another guy that I would actually we would move in with. He was attending, or he was he was I think he was already at MI. He was just back visiting or something, and he and showed up at the guitar contest. I'm not totally sure. It's it's a long time ago. Um, I haven't bought Aquanet in years. Anyway, so we we go to Nam, and I'm 16, right? And I got my David Lee Roth tour shirt on. I got I got. Like, Roth just freaking showed Van Halen up, man. He got Sheehan, he got Vi, and he got Bissonette, like, out of nowhere. Apparently, Bissonette just blindly auditioned, and and uh, Steve and him hit it off because Bissonette could read charts and stuff. And, you know, all the other rock guys, um, really, they weren't as flexible. And uh, so, anyway, I'm walking around Nam. And you name it, you know, you're, I'm walking out, oh, there's Dweezil Zappa. And then I'm looking, so then I'm looking at Dweezil, right? And I'm like, I'm like, what a charmed asshole, man, you know? I'm, I'm just like, I was like so jealous. I'm like, wow, he's Frank Zappa's son. Look at that bastard. He's got all these people around him and shit. I think he had some blonde with him too or something. I'm just like, this is ridiculous. You know, I got to cut through the mustard here. When I get in the business, you know, I, it's no nepotism. I'm I'm going I'm going on my own track. So anyway, then we walked around a little bit more, and then I see this guy and he's on a pedestal, right? And he's got <laughs> he's got this guitar that's like blue, like my shirt, but it's like it's like like a spaceship. It was like one of those explorers, those Gibson shapes, but it was like transparent, like you could kind of see, like it had bars, like it was some sort of vehicle. And he was tapping. He was doing all these weird, like, eight, and he was tapping with, like, all of his fingers. I mean, this guy was s silly. He had sunglasses on, and he was just doing his thing. And that ended up being uh, Mitch Perry. And Mitch Perry was in Talos. So I really thought he was cool. I mean, he was just sitting there, and we were, like, the only two people watching him, really, um, at this point, anyway. 
because he was just so out there and we were talking with him for a little bit. He was a very nice guy. So then I, we walked around a little bit more and I got kind of separated. Danny kind of went off looking for Billy Sheehan <laughs> <coughs> and I went off trying to hunt down like my guys. So uh, where am I going to go, right? I'm at Nam. I'm thinking, oh man, you know, I got to go to the Ibanez booth, you know. I mean, I walked past BC Rich and I saw the BC Rich thing and, and I saw McAlpine and I'm like, oh my God, you know, Tony McAlpine. There, I'm like, there's no way Tony is, is going to be here. That guy was just, you know, I love Tony McAlpine, you know. Um, I eventually even got his demo. A friend gave it to me and I, it, it, I still cherish it. Um, so anyway, so I make my way down, right? I'm Sixteen year old kid, got my hair sprayed and got my you know two tone Bon Jovi thing going, and I go to the Ibanez booth. I figure I'm gonna sit, I'm gonna hang at the Ibanez booth. So I'm like sitting there scoping out the Ibanez. And I, when I say booth, it's just a, it's just an area, right? It's just this big open area, and there's guitars on the wall. And lo and behold, I'm like out of the corner of my eye. I see Bruce Boulet, Boulet, and like Bruce is like the invisible member of Razor X, right? So, and Razor X at this time was like, it was like so underground. They were like punk rock or something. And I'm like, I'm like, oh shit, there's there's Bruce Boulet. And I I was like nervous as hell, right? And 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 then I I was like he was kind of walking down this area in the Ibanez area. Behind the Ibanez area was like a cafeteria. There was like tables and stuff. And Bruce was in the distance, but I picked him up quick. I was like, oh shit. And I'm sit I'm standing there and I I kind of like look to my right and I'm the only one here, right? And I look to my right and it's Paul. And I was like, my, I, I, I was like, I was speechless. And he said, he's like, hey, what's up? And I'm like, uh, 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 not much, man. I think I even had my head down, and I'm just like, holy shit, you know? And I'm like, Paul, man. I'm like, Ugh. and he's like, you know, he, these other people are just walking by him, you know, like nobody cared. Other people were like behind us and around us. Nobody, you know, like huddled around the guy. And I'm just like, Paul, you have to understand, man. You're like part. You're you're ch like changed my life. You know, you're changing my life. You personally. And he's like, oh, cool. You know, and he's like, do you, do you, you know, and I'm like, oh, I've been playing. I I I, I learned the stuff. And he's like, oh, cool. And he while he's talking to me, he picks up this guitar, right? He takes like an Ibanez, one of those, you know, neon green or whatever they were, orange. He takes one of those down, and he's just sitting there. He's like holding it up while he's talking to me. <clears throat> and and um, I think he even got down on the ground, like he even knelt down, and he was, he and he just had he whipped out a pick, and he was he was playing while he was talking to me. But I was like, why am I going to keep talking? I don't want to talk. I want to watch this guy play. So I was watching him play. And when I watched him play, I realized, like, all the things that I learned, like YRO and and street lethal or whatever, all those lines where it was rapid fire and, and all locked in with that, that um, alternate picking, it was, it, mine was horrible. I mean, it, I was playing these versions, right? But I was picking it like not strict alternate picking. I was, I did like my own version of the, doing it. And I was young enough, you know, to, to say, I gotta change this, you know, this is something that I have, I have to understand. And when I saw him pick Paul, he picked up, like, like for me, okay, when I played in a uh, guitar, played in even bands, it was like, I plugged in, I, I had a PV Renown, right, I had this amp that was like, you know, like a, like a bench, you know, it had two big 12 inch, it's the PV Renown, right. And, I mean, the first thing I do is, you know, crank the gain up, right? And then I'd make sure, of course, all my action on my guitar was like butter. And then I just, you just go for it, you know? You just use your ear and you, it, it wasn't like I was paying, I wasn't paying, I didn't have a lot of pick stroke awareness, right? 
So when people would see me play, they'd be like, oh my God, that was phenomenal, blah, blah, blah. And I was a kid, right? I ate it up. I was like, oh yeah, but hey, I started when I was like 10 and I busted my ass and I had good teachers. I was fortunate, right? And Lynch, I could kind of slur around good, you know? You got those slurred lines like your Warren D. Martini, those more swanky, slurry, less technical. So I was kind of, you know, coming from that when I was watching Paul and I realized I was like, my my technique is it sucks it's horrible so and I didn't I wasn't a bad player or anything I mean I, I was in guitar contests and stuff pretty young but it was just like I was smart enough to look at the big picture and go dude you're you're, you're, you're done you're out to lunch so I and then Paul gets done right at Nam and he's like you do you want to play and he, he's like I'm gonna hand me the guitar and I'm like oh no no <laughs> no 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 I, I don't want to play that's okay and he's like, oh man, you know, and, and, and I was like, and then he's like, hey, man, you know, I got some eight by tens or something. You want, you want uh, me to sign these? And he grabbed the, the, these things out of a folder and he, and he signed it and he said, keep bashing out A chords. And he had like 64th notes or 128th notes written, you know, and he signed it. So he was a very sweet guy. Paul was just very, and, and nothing like, spectacular to look at he was really tall lanky and he was not like he wasn't dressed up or anything he wasn't it wasn't rock and roll he was just walking around man and virtually unknown anyway so that was cool and then um getting away from the git thing we'll get back to that in a little while so then i'm walking around nam and a little bit more right so then i run into michael angelo badio at, 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 at that point, he wasn't Badio. He was Michael. He Originally with Holland or something, there was a band called Holland. Or they were called London. Or I forget. Holland. Same, he's from the Midwest, so he's a Midwestern guy like me. So he, he has that accent, you know, like that uh, William H. Macy kind of sound. So Fargo, right? So I'm, you know, I'm like, all right, you know, Michelangelo. You know, I kind of heard about him, you know. But, I mean, I, I didn't hear him, you know, I didn't, he was just more of a, a, a name. I, didn't, I wasn't familiar with him, you know. Um, I was a pretty young kid, you know, and I, I, I didn't follow his original bands. He's been around for a while. So then he's talking to me. Of course, he's going to gravitate towards this impressionable kids and stuff. <clears throat> and he's like, I'm Michelangelo. And I'm like, cool, you know. I th I'm like, yeah, you know. I, 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 you look familiar. I think I've seen your picture. It's like, oh yeah, you know, um, I'm working with the Japanese. You know, the Japanese are trying to, you know, transcribe. I play a lot of notes, you know, and I, and and they're trying to figure out a way to, to to notate what I play because I play so fast, you know. And I was just like, wow, this guy is kind of, you know, he's talking about things that are, you know aren't seemingly very musical to me, but he was very nice, very sweet. Um, he was very high strung too, very nervous, kind of, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, um, I want to say anxious. He was a very anxious person, probably anxious to get famous, you know. He must have been really anxious. I mean, he was making guitars with like four necks on it, you know, and playing this way and playing that way. I'm sure he was, you know, pretty er um, sorry, eager or urgent in his, um, in his um, execution to be the, you know, apparently the best player anybody's ever seen. And he was a nice guy. So anyway, so I walk around a little bit more. And then I talk, then I see Vinnie Moore. And Vinnie Moore was like another guy that I was like baffled by. Like the technical thing, it was like beyond, it was even better than Malmsteen. Like in some ways, Paul Gilbert and, and Vinnie Moore took Malmsteen kind of thing. And neither of them, I don't, I think Paul was more, you know, from that, like, but Vinnie Moore wasn't really, like, Vinnie Moore was just an anomaly. He was more of, probably from a jazz background and stuff, and he just kind of, you know, naturally fell into that kind of playing. But it's just like anything, once you do something, people want to put you together and lump you together in some sort of a genre, so they can, you know, define you and, and sell you, ultimately. So, <clears throat> I'm talking to Vinnie Moore, 
And um, and and it, the funny thing is, is I I was already sending demos to Spotlight to Mike Varney. I was already like getting my writing instrumentals like on my um dr with the drum machine and stuff. I was already putting together like you know even uh, I even had uh, recordings I sent to Varney where I used two ghetto blasters and I would do like the Racer X thing. I do like this line with no accompaniment or just be blowing I blow a bunch of riffs with this line on this deck and I record it right and then I would take that tape and put it in this deck right and then I would put another cassette tape in that deck and then I harmonize with the, the lines that I did on that one so I plan it all out so I was just you just play it you push play and it was like cacophony you know it just come at you with like two guitars and I was already doing all that kind of stuff and um, and Vinnie Moore was like oh that's awesome you know and, and and it's cool and everything you know and and I'm like but he wasn't really you know impressed or he he was just kind of like nonchalant about it and he was kind of looking at me like he was concerned and I said I said, well, you know, what what's the hesitation, Vinny? You know, I mean, you know, you're not like saying, hey, go for it, you know. And he's just like, well, let me tell you, kid, you know. He's like, you know, what I do, you know, it's like he's like, I didn't take a you know a limo here, you know. Um, this stuff, you know, Mike gets the money, you know. I don't really, you know, get that much money, and I was like. What? You know? How does that work? You're doing all, you're playing all this stuff. It's like, yeah, but, he, you know, he signs you and then you have to sign over rights and all this stuff. And to me, at that point, I just didn't understand all that. I was like, I thought if you were on record, you were, you know, you're a rock star, <laughs> you know? So anyway, he just said, hey, be careful. Don't, he said, actually do as I say, don't do, don't do as I do. He said, I'm not going in that direction myself, and I wouldn't advise you to do it, um, to see it through. It's not very fruitful. So, you know, I, I still actually um, went back in contact with Varney, but when I went back in contact with, or, I mean, not contact with him, but sending him stuff, it, at this point, one time I just called him on the phone. I'm like, hey, Mike, because I got his number from my friend, and, I'm like, hey, Mike, and he's like, who's this? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I know you don't know me or anything. I'm like, my name's Aaron. I, you know, I just want to play you, you know, a couple. Tr I want to play you a song, and I recorded a pretty good tune, pretty decent track. I don't even really have it physically here. It's in Wisconsin, in a on a cassette, but it was done in a 24 track studio. It sounded pretty cool. He said I reminded him of Ingve, um, a young Malmsteen, and he said, please, keep, you know keep in touch he said you know get a band together and you know that was after I talked to Vinnie Moore like 10 years later and that was when Nevermind uh, Nirvana album came out and so it was like you know all that technique and all that prowess and all the things that everybody worked up to towards at least I did you know all that stuff would would just then I'm sorry uh, spit a little bit um, it would just then be scoffed at. I mean, we were like immediately like pariahs, you know. It was just like, oh no, uh, uh, wheely wheely deedly arpeggios, oh you know. And then I mean, and then L.A., you know. I mean, it was like, and then L.A. changed. It was like, I remember them telling me something about. Um, I think it was called. Sound on sound, or uh, yeah, I th I'm pretty sure it was sound on sound, where the studio they recorded was across from a rehearsal place, and all the metal bands like Dio and Keel and and uh, whatever Rat probably. I mean, it was a big place. It was called the, I think it was called the Fortress, and the, the 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 rusty van, the rusty white van would pull pull in every day to the studio and these like bum looking guys would get out and these these guys in the bands be on their smoke break like guys in keel or something and they're you know they're rock stars 
and signed to MCA Records and shit, and they're looking at these bums getting out of this white van and stuff. You know, I remember that, you know. Um, I remember hearing that Ron Keel actually went over there. He was, he, they, they were like so tired of making fun of these guys. Like, who are these homeless looking dudes? And they were there, you know, and then they would leave. And then, so finally, Ron Keel just says, I'm going over there. And, uh, you know, I know somebody over there. I'll just get in there and listen to it. And I remember that. He went in and apparently walked out and quit his band, like, immediately. He just walked into the studio, listened to, like, Smells Like Teen Spirit, like, one time with a, somebody let him in. And he just said, I'm done. Uh, and he walked out and he quit everything. And he like moved to Nashville or something. And now he does, now he's Ronnie Lee Keel. He does country. But anyway, on that note, I'm at like 26 minutes. Holy shit. All right. Well, this is one of many. I, I got a, a bunch coming. I know I didn't talk much about MI yet. I didn't even really get there. But I just went off. I wanted to give you guys some background um, on at least where I came from. And it's just sad, you know, it's, it, it, it's devastating, okay? When you're a kid and you think you're going to plan your life out, you, you are determined. You even say, no, I'm not going to college. I'm going to rock and roll high school. I'm going to freaking GIT in Hollywood. I'm going to go rub elbows with everybody. And I did, okay? I went out there. I did everything by the book. You know, your hair, you got to have the right hair. You got to wear the right stretch jeans. You got to have the right fucking paisley shirt, right? And, and necklaces and shit. And I went there and you know what? I was just starting, everything was starting to kind of culminate, you know? More bands expanding, getting deals. This, uh, Sunset Strip was like 30,000 people walking around every Friday and Saturday night. Sunset Strip was like a riot scene. You guys have to understand, people walking around handing out flyers by the thousands. Come see my band, come see my band, hey. You know, all these studly, you know, cool guys. Got, you know, everybody looked like Tommy Lee. They were all like nine feet tall and had hair, jet black hair, you know. It was just, it was unreal and when, when Nirvana came out, the, it was like, it, after about a year or two, it was gone. There was nobody around. You might go to the Rainbow or the Roxy or, or the Whiskey, and you might run into, like, you know, the guys in Bullet Boys or something. But it was like, you'd ask them, what are you guys doing? They're like, we're dropped. We're, you know, what? You'd go talk to this guy. Oh, you know... Um, what, what are you doing? Oh, we're done, man. It's, it's over. You know, everybody, <laughs> it was over for everybody, including me. And now, now where am I? You know, I'm 46, yeah, 46, and I'm nowhere, right? So I got Cobain to thank for that one. <laughs> All right. Take care, guys.